Support for On Point with Tom Ashbrook and the following message comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage's completely online process lets you get a custom mortgage solution wherever and whenever you want. Check out Rocket Mortgage at quickenloans.com slash on point. From WBUR Boston and NPR, I'm Tom Ashbrook and this is On Point. Last year, for the first time, the oral history project StoryCorps sent out a call to listeners asking for their family stories as part of what they called the Great Thanksgiving Listen. They asked young people to interview their loved ones, family elders, when the whole family was home for Thanksgiving, and ultimately they had 50,000 submissions pour in. We're going to dip into that bounty on this Thanksgiving Eve to see what we can learn from their stories and from yours. This hour on Point Family Stories for Thanksgiving and beyond. You can join us on air or online where this conversation is always on. Tell us your Thanksgiving stories, the family stories you've heard or would like to hear to share across the table. Join us anytime at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. Here's a little montage of people introducing their loved ones on tape for last year's great Thanksgiving listen from StoryCorps. So this is the Great Listen for 2015. I'm here with my grandmother, Nana Fran. And I'm speaking with my mama. I have my greatest grandmother in the whole universe here with me today. I am recording my grandmother. Say hey, Grandma. Hey. I'm speaking with my grandpa. So, Grandpa, hi. Hi, Samantha. Um, Ask me anything, darling. (laughs) I'm speaking with my bubby, Irma Gershkowitz. How do you do? It's nice to be on this phone with you. Oh, boy, and we are ready to dive in. Are we ever ready? Joining me now from New York is Dave Isay, founder and president of StoryCorps, an oral history project which records interviews from around the country, archives them at the Library of Congress. Dave Isay, welcome to On Point. Thank you very much for joining us on the eve of Thanksgiving. Tom, it's great to be here. 50,000 recordings came in. That is a lot. How did you how did you collect them? How do they come in? How does it work? Well, yeah, we were we were surprised too and I have to say I, I loved hearing that montage. It's great to get the name Irma Gershkowitz on the, on <laughs> yes, the air whenever yes, possible. Yes, it is. Um so, yeah, so last year we um we launched an app that makes it possible for the first time to record StoryCorps interviews anytime any place on your mobile device and with one tap upload it to our archive and to the Library of Congress. So your great 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 grandkids can someday get to know whoever it is you interviewed through their voice and story. You know, we've had these booths across the country for yeah. the last 13 years where you go and you make an appointment and there's a facilitator. And we've heard these stories on Morning interview. Edition on Fridays right. forever and they're wonderful. Exactly. And those and those are the stories you hear on on Morning Edition. We do mm-hmm. animations and 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 books. Um, but we wanted to see if we could scale the the interview experience. And I was actually a little bit, you know, I I, I didn't know if it would work to do this on a cell phone if the facilitator wasn't present. But from the minute we launched it at um, TED uh, last year, the um, you know people were using it with complete fidelity to the spirit of the project. People who had never heard of StoryCorps had never listened to NPR. A lot of kind of small towns yeah. in the south. Yeah. Um, and then we decided, like, can we scale this? And we came up with this idea of the Great Thanksgiving Listen. So um, we asked U.S. history and social studies teachers to um, assign their um, students to record, as you said, an elder over Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And we had we had about an eight-week run-up um, and did a bunch of media, but we didn't know if it was going to work. And in fact, um, on Thursday of Thanksgiving, we saw a slight uptick in the number of interviews that, that were coming in, but nothing dramatic. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. on Friday, it was the same thing. And on Saturday, we got nervous. Um, and I started doing interviews saying, you know, we this failed, um, <laughs> but we're going to try it again because, yeah. you know, next year because listening to each other is so important. And then on Sunday night, um, I got a text from a colleague saying, look at what's happening on the app. And indeed, 50,000 stories <laughs> came in. Um, and that was, you know, I hadn't. I should have known. Um, I'm an old dad. I have young kids. Yeah. Kids wait till Sunday night to do their homework. <laughs> right. Do it. Do so, it. Do um, it last minute. Hold, hold the hold the story right there. Pause. Push. Yeah. Pause. We've got so sure. many of these. We want to dip in and hear them because they're just yeah. so great. Uh, we're going to play them all through the hour. And listeners, we want to hear your family stories, stories you might share across the family Thanksgiving table. This is 86 year old James Kennicott, and he's talking with his 21 year old granddaughter Kara Mosteller in her car. In the parking lot of an Applebee's in Waterloo, Iowa, 
He talks about his difficult upbringing, loved ones he's lost, and gives her, gave her in the Great Thanksgiving Listen some advice about growing older. Hi, my name is Kara Masteller, and I interviewed my grandfather in my 1994 Buick. How did you know that grandma was the one? Well, she was a good looker. <laughs> <laughs> we fit together. We were a good pair. My grandma, everyone referred to her as like a spicy meatball. She swore a lot, but she looked so innocent that no one ever expected her to say the things that she said. Were you nervous to propose to her? No. We had something to say, we said it. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> what are your keys to a happy marriage? If something happens, just say I'm sorry and get it over with. <laughs> There's no reason to carry on. I just say I'm sorry. I love you. And that was the whole story. <laughs> I was really surprised by my grandpa saying sorry. I've never heard him say sorry. How would you like to be remembered? Remember? <laughs> Do you want to be remembered as, like, a real tough guy, or...? Yeah, I was a pretty soft guy. When you I, intimidated when me when I was little. <laughs> I did. Yeah, you did. Are you happy about the life you've lived? Oh, yeah. It wasn't the easiest life back in them days. Mother died when I was four, and it was a tough life. He tells one story about how he was eight or nine, and he was ice skating on the river, and he fell through. He didn't have hot water wherever he was living with his dad, so he broke into the school and just took a hot shower in the school. I think that says a lot about his childhood, that there was really no one there to help him get out of the water or keep him warm. Last April, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I had never heard him say much about it. What do you think about Alzheimer's? There's much you can do. I even can't remember some names now myself. <laughs> no, maybe I have got it. I don't know. And when he said, I, I don't know what it would be like to have it, that was difficult for me. So then I had to ask a follow-up just out of, I don't know, self-preservation because I thought I was going to cry. As people age, do you have any advice for them about getting older? It's coming. <laughs> don't fight it. Just roll with it. I mean... Real life. Live it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Grandpa. After the interview, my grandpa and I talked a lot more. The last thing he said before we <laughs> before we got out of the car was, Let's give him hell, kiddo. From the great Thanksgiving listen last year, 21-year-old Kara Masteller talking with her granddad, James Kennicott, that's incredible. What an exchange. That even falling through the ice and his mother's young, is dead when he was four, and, you know, breaks into the school to get warm because there's nothing warm at home. That is, but that is so produced, Dave. I'm surprised. This sounds like This American <laughs> Life. I mean, she's narrating over. You got music and all the rest. Yeah, of well, that that was, I think we, um, I, I actually am hearing that uh, just for the second time. I think we did that after um, the Great Thanksgiving Listen and asked her to come in and talk about her experience. Ah, she guys gussied it up. Um, it doesn't have to be that yeah. fancy. That's right. No. And, and um, you know, I think – but as you say w with the stories, and I think the rest of the ones uh, that we're going to listen to, none of which have been broadcast before, mm -hmm. are not fancy. They're just excerpts from these interviews. And as you said, I mean, people – part of the magic of what happens on um, – in, in StoryCorps is that the microphone, uh, in this case the cell phone, gives you the license to talk about what's really important yeah. um, and to talk about things you don't normally get to talk about. And we see that over and over and over again, 50,000 times, in fact, last uh, uh, Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, Dave Isay from StoryCorps here. Here's an interview between 13-year-old Lauren and her grandfather, Claude, the great Thanksgiving listen. She started by asking whether he had any regrets in his life. Is there anything you regret having not told somebody? I don't know if you would call this a regret because actually it was prevented. My mother lived in Brooklyn and I was working one day a week in Brooklyn and I would normally stop by to tell my mom that I was on my way home and she would be sending me back with either my favorite meal or something that your mother really liked. And on this particular day, I was really in a rush and I took whatever package my mother had ready and I headed for the door and my mother called back to me and she said you're not even going to kiss me goodbye and I stopped immediately and I went back and I kissed my mother and uh, I said I'm sorry mom well that following Monday morning my mother was struck and killed by a car so it was the last time I ever saw my mother 
I mean, I could have very easily gone out the door and never told her I love her, and those words would have, would have been really lost forever. And it's not quite the answer to your question, but uh, that's what came to my mind in any case. It definitely answers the question. 13-year-old Lauren and her granddad, Claude, the great Thanksgiving listen. Wow, what a story to convey to a 13-year-old granddaughter that she might never, ever have heard that little nuanced moment between him and his mother many, many decades earlier, Dave. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, so much of StoryCorps is kind of about collecting the wisdom of humanity, and there is a great lesson about saying, I love you to the people who, um, you know, when when you're saying goodbye to people, because life is so tenuous and, and you never know. And we've heard that story um, told many, many times in the, you know, about a quarter of a million people have participated in StoryCorps so far, and we've heard it. We've heard it a lot. It's it's an important lesson. Is it hard? Is it easy to do these interviews? Do people stumble it's, around, it's, or it just kind of rolls? Well, it just rolls, you know, and and you know, we, again, we hope that people will will um, participate this Thanksgiving. And I know it's late for um, teachers are in school um, now, but um, assign it as an extra um, uh, credit um, uh, assignment over over the the break. It's easy. People want to be listened to. I mean, one of the things we're doing this year, we're doing kind of a post election pivot. And you know, last year we had asked U.S. history and social studies teachers to do this, so that every year there's a new. Um, group of students slotting in this year. We're asking everyone to to, to participate and talk about um, their feelings after the election and some wisdom about how the, to bring the country together. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. We're talking this hour with StoryCorps about family stories from their great Thanksgiving listen. They did it last year for the first time. It's out there again this year. And we're inviting your family stories from the Thanksgiving table. Dave Isay, founder and president of StoryCorps, is with us. Uh, you can get a link to their app, which will help you collect family stories if you've got the itch at our website, onpointradio.org. And you can join us this hour. What's your favorite family Thanksgiving story about the holiday or family history? Have you invited a family member to tell their story? And what did you learn from it? What did you gain from listening? We've got lots of tape lined up here from StoryCorps. It's pretty terrific. We'll share a bunch before this hour is over. We want to hear from you as well. Boulder, Colorado, Priscilla is calling. Hi, Priscilla, you're on the air. What's your story? I grew up in Auburn, New York, upstate New York, and I'm 88 years old, Mm -hmm. and this uh, was before the days that turkeys came all wrapped in plastic and (laughs) picked them up in the supermarket. You went to the butcher. Uh, They often had pin feathers left in them. Mm. My father would get the the turkey, uh, give it a bath in uh, the dishpan with soapy water, scrub it, and the the apartment we lived in was a really old house, and it at one time had been lighted the apartments by gas, uh, you know, jets. Sure. There was still one in the kitchen. And uh, you could turn, you could turn the little, little uh, switch and... uh, And You'd actually have a flame there. You'd have a flame there. Where's this going? Where's this going, Priscilla? (laughs) Well, my father would give the turkey a bath, dry it out, Hoist it up over the flame to singe the <laughs> up on the wall off, oh my instead God. of picking them out. Yeah. So I have a memory of singed feathers as in a beginning aroma early early Thanksgiving morning. Singed feathers <laughs> aroma <laughs> with your dad up against the wall with the turkey at the at the gas flame there. Oh my goodness, that's pretty great. You remember it all these years later, Priscilla. I beg your pardon. You remember it all these years later. Oh, I remember lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you, I really appreciate you bringing that to us. That's just fantastic. David, it's that kind of little moment. I mean, talk about loss to history if we don't get it down. The idea of a gas flame coming out of the wall from the lighting system and Priscilla's dad up there with his newly bathed turkey singeing off the pin feathers. It's just a great image. Yeah. And, and you know, I hope that, Priscilla, that someone in your family is listening to this and they'll pull out the StoryCorps app and, and interview you. Um, you know, when you have these kind of conversations, two things uh, to guarantee. One is that you're going to fi- you're going to talk about, find out things you never knew about, no matter how well you know the person you're interviewing. And the second is that you'll never regret it. You know, these interviews, they live forever at the Library of Congress, at the American Folklife Center. And, and that act of um, sitting and, and listening to someone and telling them how much uh, they mean to you by by just asking them about about their lives and their memories, their dreams, um, how they want to be remembered is incredibly powerful. It's mainly young people who did this with elders in the family. But here's a teacher who recorded a story for StoryCorps uh, about his grandparents' relationship with their mailman, Bucky, for the Great Thanksgiving Listen last year. 
My grandfather, for a very brief time, worked at the post office. He was just a mail sorter, kind of like a clerk. One day, the postman who delivered the mail called in sick, and they asked my grandfather, said, Bill, will you deliver the mail today? And he said, yeah, sure, no problems, I'll deliver the mail today, thinking that the job was not too tough. And uh, needless to say, he lasted one day as a delivery man before he said, I can't do this anymore. You know, he said that he almost had a heat stroke trying to deliver the mail one day. So my grandparents then, you know, because of this experience, were very, very respectful towards their mailman. His name was Bucky, the mailman. Whenever Bucky would come to the door, they would invite him in, and they'd give him, you know, a glass of iced tea and a sandwich. And I can remember being there one summer, and we were going to go run an errand or something like that. My grandfather was all, like, shaky and, you know, a little bit nervous. And I was like, Gramps, what are you nervous about? And he's like, well, I'm afraid that Bucky is going to come to deliver the mail, and we're not going to be here. He won't get his glass of iced tea and his sandwich. What would he do? He got out uh, his cooler and made him his glass of iced tea and a sandwich and put it in a cooler on the porch so that Bucky could have his sandwich and his iced tea, even if they weren't there. And they did that you know, every day when he came to deliver the mail. And when my grandmother passed away, uh, we were at the funeral home, and this gentleman came up to us, and I kind of looked at him. He looked somewhat familiar, and I introduced myself, and he said, Hey, I'm Bucky the Mailman, and I'm here because you know, your grandparents cared about me. And that's how my grandfather was. You know, always cared about people. A sweet story from StoryCorps' Great American Listen about Bucky the Mailman and uh, you know, one grandfather who came to know how tough it could be to deliver the mail. But it's not all sugar and spice. There's tough stuff in the Great American Listen as well. Here's a 15-year-old girl from Columbus, Ohio, interviewing her grandfather about how he became blind. I was blinded in 2001 while I was driving my car Uh, There were three young boys up on top of a bridge. One of the young boys, by the name of Jacob, dropped an eight to ten pound rock off the bridge. It came through the windshield of my car and hit me in the face. It literally broke every bone in my face. And at that time, I lost both of my eyes. How did it feel when you met face to face with Jacob again? It was a number of years before I went to visit Jacob in the prison. And um, I I equate it to kind of like going to your own funeral. (laughs) I just, you know, it was like, I'm going, but I don't want to go. I'm I'm going, but I feel like I'm going to be sick to my stomach. But I, I knew if I could meet him, And he could see me as a person, and I could see him as a person, that it would help me to deal with forgiving him, but more moving on with my life. You know, when something devastating like this happens to you, normally our reaction is to react with violence and hatred. Uh, And I didn't want my children and my grandchildren uh, to be subjected to such violence and hatred in their life. Well, I thank you, and I'm glad that you inspire me to do good. Wow. And I love you. Thank you. Wow. Sweet lessons, tough lessons, deep lessons from the great Thanksgiving (laughs) listen. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I think, and what, what, I I love getting the chance to hear these things. I mean, what could be a more important story to hear at this um, at this moment in uh, in in American history? And I think that you know what comes out of those two stories you played—the mailman Mm -hmm. story and the one we just heard. I mean, these are the great American values: it's kindness, decency, empathy. It's like make America good again. You know, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael in Cromwell, Connecticut. You're on with Dave Isay, founder of StoryCorps and the Country. Thanks for calling, Michael. You're on the air. Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, stories about my grandfather. Um, I'm 61. My grandfather, I moved in with uh, my family. I was about 10 years old, uh, 65, uh, and my little brother. Mm-hmm. Gramps was born in 1878 in Bavaria, and he uh, moved. Uh, he, he came to America with his father and one of his brothers, uh, landed at Ellis Island January 1st, 1893. 
Wow. He came over on the, the ship, the Rhinelander, and mm-hmm. I was able to find all that on the Ellis Island website. But in any case, the, the story is, is great because uh, my little brother and I love Grandpa's stories. So after dinner, sometimes we would say, Grandpa, tell us the time you came to America. So uh, he'd fold up his paper napkin and stick it in his pocket, which seems <laughs> weird, but I, I think it was just a product of leaner times. Yep. <laughs> but in any case, so he'd... He told us that he came over. They were they packed him in on steerage um, in the steerage hold. All the all the folks that didn't have a lot of money and they were they ate out of a common huge uh, cauldron of, of food that was put together. Some people were ill. Some wow. people were okay. But uh, as a boy of fourteen, you know you, you can imagine during the journey over, he got fairly bored. So he wandered around, found his way up on deck. So they're coming across the Atlantic, and this is in uh, December, January, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, a rogue wave comes along and and grabs him, washes him all the way down to the back of the boat. Oh my God. And uh, a rope that's slung across the back grabs him in the middle and saves his life. Uh, he said it took his shoes and his socks right off his body, just washed him right off. Um, so uh, an alert uh, uh, a sailor up in the up in the uh, the bridge sees this. So he comes down and grabs my grandfather and he takes him and he brings him down to the boiler, gives him a blanket, got all the wet clothes off him to dry him out, give him something something hot to drink. Yeah. So it, it uh, so now the story never varied very much. It, it always seemed to be the same. And we always want to know, well, Grandpa, what happened? You know, what did Grandpa, what did your father say yeah. uh, when he found you missing? Did he ever hear the story? And uh, did you ever tell him? And, and we never got a straight answer on it. M- Michael, do you wish you had the sound of your grandfather's voice on on tape now, telling that story? Um, I might have it on tape somewhere <laughs> back way back when. Yeah, I. I just might have that. It'd be something else to... to, so to I, I, I wish I did have it. Yes, if that's what you're asking, yes. I, I wish I had that. To have it at your fingertips, that. to be able to hear it again. I guess that's the story core oh, mission God. here. Michael, thank you for yeah, sharing and, and, that, that, vision of, that, that vision of your granddad nearly washed overboard more than 100 years ago on his way over from Bavaria. Dave? And Michael, you know, I hope you'll, you know, at Thanksgiving, with whether it's with a, a, a kid in your family or with someone else, take the app and record that story. You know, get all your grandfather's stories down, even though it's a couple of generations past, um, so that you can have it f- for the future. You know, I think we we live at, at this moment where kind of, I don't know, StoryCorps is so much about permanence. Um, and um, and we, we live in a moment where so much of the content we have just kind of disappears after 10 seconds. And uh, and we, we kind of devalue memory. And, and, you know, our past is extremely, extremely important for our families to understand and to hear. Hang on to it. Know it. Own it. Michael, I really appreciate your story and your call. Dan in Michigan, Allen Park, Michigan. Dan, you're on the air. Thank you for calling. Hi, Tom. How are you? Well. Good. Um, I'm actually I'm an English teacher in Allen Park, Michigan, and uh, for this <clears throat> a couple of weeks leading up to our Thanksgiving break, uh, we've been uh, preparing to do this assignment. Um, so we we listen to uh, Dave's uh, TED talk, both of them actually, uh, and every day we've been kind of listening to a different story for a message, one of the different stories online. And uh, I actually work at an alternative school, so I have a lot of kids that have kind of had uh, breaks in their families. They've been separated from some people. Um, so they were kind of hesitant at first. They didn't know who they were going to interview. It kind of made them nervous. But as we started listening to more and more StoryCorps uh, episodes, there's just such a diversity. Um, and even people that have I, – I have kids that have had uh, parents that have passed. I, I encourage them to get together with a sibling or someone that knew them well and just try to share that memory between the people. You don't necessarily have to um, interview somebody, but just sharing that message. Um, so, Did the kids welcome the example. assignment, Dan? Do your students say, yeah, that sounds good, let's go? You know what? Uh, they they've they've kind of taken to it. Uh, like I said, we um, you know at first they were kind of nervous, um, but again, uh, they're, it's, it's a great resource having the StoryCorps um, the website. We've been listening to them every day, so it's actually I, I had some students that they they actually came up with the idea before we left for break. They wanted to actually interview each other um, because you know a little practice that they have to, <laughs> exactly. So we did that yesterday. Um, it, it was because we're on break today, so they, they really took off with it. Um, I actually had one student interview me, which I, I was a little taken aback by, but it, he actually did a very, very good job. Um, you know, Dave says like, we're talking about how smooth it is. The app gives you all the prompting. 
Um, you yeah. Prepare your questions, so it kind of gives you everything that you need at your fingertips. To grab those memories. Good luck with what comes in there. You never know what will come in. Here from StoryCorps, 14-year-old Katie interviewing her parents for the great Thanksgiving listen about what it was like to pick her up from the airport when they adopted her from Korea. What was it like when you first saw me? It was right after 9-11. Well, they didn't allow us to go to the gate. We had to wait up in the terminal. So there was also another couple there that had adopted a little boy that was coming on the same airplane. We had our signs. We waited forever. And all these people came off the airplane. And we said, did you see two little babies? And they said, yeah, they're cute, but boy, they were loud on the way over. We had the other family. We had the adoption agency. Your Grammy was there. And so we all spread out through the baggage terminal to be able to find you. And then someone yelled, we found them, we found them. And that's when we ran over and you all were both dressed exactly alike. And we couldn't tell which one was Katie well, and which one was Evan until they took the hats off. And then we could definitely tell that we had our little Katie. And more, we want more. Here's a 13-year-old girl interviewing her dad about his childhood, told about his love of baseball and his relationship with his own father, a musician, lived only for a short time with him. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? Well, I was really into sports, baseball in particular. My hero was Roberto Clemente, and when I was 10, I even took a bus to City Hall. I told them I wanted to change my name legally to Roberto, and they promptly called my mother and told her to come pick me up. Um, But my father lived in Indianapolis, and I lived in Pennsylvania, and I would spend a week with him in the summertime. And when I was about six or seven, he came to pick me up. He bought me my first mitt and a baseball, And we drove to Indianapolis. And the whole way out, every time I asked him to play catch, he would pull the car over at the nearest rest stop and he would play catch with me for as long as I wanted. I must have asked him ten times on that drive. And every time he stopped. Do you think you're like your dad in any way? Well, neither one of us have hair. (laughs) But other than that, we're really very different people. And that's one of the things I actually cherish most about him. He always accepted me for what I was. If we were strangers and we just met, you know, in a bar or whatever, we really wouldn't agree with each other on very many things, but we respected each other. 13-year-old girl interviewing her father about his childhood and his father. Dave, I say I love that story. He didn't see his father often, but when they did and they drove, he would pull over any time he asked to play catch (laughs) 10 times in one drive. Uh, it's the detail. It's the little detail that just makes your eyes light up. Absolutely. It's like everything you need to learn about life is uh, is contained in, in these in these little clips. We're listening back to the Great Thanksgiving Listen recordings, just some of the 50,000 that came in last Thanksgiving. You can join us this hour. What about it? Have you invited a family member to tell their story to you? What did you learn? What did you gain from listening? Now, have the stories changed over the years, become a little truer, a little grittier, more honest Johnny Cash with Thanksgiving Hymn. Dave Isay, founder and president of StoryCorps, please stand by. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. I'm grateful for the laughter of children, the sun and the wind and the rain, the color of blue in your sweet eyes, the sight of a highball and train. The moon rise over a prairie And old love that you've made new And this year when I count my blessings Support for On Point with Tom Ashbrook and the following message comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings home financing into the 21st century with a completely online process that's fast, easy, and convenient. Using a phone or tablet, you can safely share bank statements and pay stubs without having to dig through piles of paperwork. It takes just a few minutes to get a custom mortgage solution on your terms wherever and whenever you want. Check out Rocket Mortgage at quickenloans.com slash on point. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS Consumer Access number 3030. I thank for all that you gave me for 
teaching me what love can do. And Thanksgiving Day for the rest of my life, I'm thanking the Lord He made you. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. And we are talking this hour with StoryCorps about family stories from their great Thanksgiving listen and inviting your family stories from the Thanksgiving table. Dave Isay is with us, founder and president of StoryCorps, ongoing oral history project. They've got an app. You can download it. There's a link at our website, onpointradio.org. makes it very easy to interview and save those interviews. And you can join us this hour. Will you be talking stories this year to avoid politics? If the politics break through, how are you going to handle that? And what's the story that gives you hope on Thanksgiving? We're doing a lot of listening here, people responding. Uh, you know, great listen is happening at our house this holiday. Uh, Carla says she's going to use it with her mom and dad. Dan reminds us of a little story a few years ago at Thanksgiving. His mom told him about, told the table about how she ran up to Fidel Castro's car when he visited New York City in 1959 and literally fell into his lap. You never know what you're going to hear. Dave Isay is with us from New York. Here's here's another great Thanksgiving listen. This is 13-year-old Lavina Tadani of Naperville, Illinois. She interviewed her 58-year-old granddad, Gope, about his childhood and how he came to America. Can you tell me the story of how and why you came to America? From my childhood, it was my dream to come to America. So from Bombay, India, I came to Chicago. I'd never seen snow in my life. (laughs) Like it was so amazing when you are inside the house and when it is snowing outside. It's amazing. It is one thing I did good in my life. I came to America because now my children and my grandchildren and their children will enjoy the fruit of that. They'll have good life. They'll have good education and all the luxuries of life. I think that is the best part of my life. Do you have any regrets? Yes, I have one big regret. I've been playing lotto since last 50 years and I'm not a millionaire yet. So that's my (laughs) biggest regret. (laughs) Lavina Tadani and her grandfather Gope. uh, Yeah, played the lottery for 50 years and not a millionaire yet, but he won a kind of lottery, I guess, he thinks, uh, right there coming to... America. Dave Isay is with us, founder and president of StoryCorps. Anthony's calling from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Anthony, thank you for calling. You're on the air. Hi, Tom. Um, I had the opportunity to interview my grandmother uh, a couple of years ago for a school assignment very similar to, to the mission behind uh, StoryCorps. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a great experience. Um, and, and at the time, it was just you know recording onto a magnetic tape and turning it into the teacher for a grade. Um, and I got to say, one of the one of the biggest things that I got out of the uh, uh, assignment mm-hmm. uh, and the experience as a whole was getting to hear the personal view of of the story that we all knew, uh, the family story of my grandmother immigrating uh, from Argentina to the United States mm-hmm. and becoming a successful dentist. And hearing the 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 you know the the things that concerned her, her fears, the the frustrations, you know what the what the whole process was like, um, definitely, I guess it shifted the story in my head mm-hmm. from something that happened to someone to something I could directly relate with, you know. And um, I, I think this is a great a great thing y'all are doing. Um, one of the biggest. Uh, uh, disappointments I have is I, I lost the tape. So, oh, boy. Um, I would, yeah, I would very much love to, to recreate that interview this year, uh, either for Thanksgiving or Christmas, and it, it would be interesting to kind of compare mental notes to how that's changed over the years. And, is your uh, grandmother still alive, Anthony? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She is it's alive like, and healthy. Well, you may have a chance to do that again. Her Her trip from Argentina and the very personal fears she felt as an immigrant there who can't relate to that, but to hear it and to hear it in her voice. Anthony, thank, thank you so much for your call. I want to get one more from Zion, Illinois. Sarah, you're on the air. Thanks for calling. Hi, Tom, and thank you so much for letting me tell you about um, Trudy, who is has become an adoptive mother to me mm-hmm. in the last few years. And um, my, mom, my mom is dead, and I am estranged from my, from my family. But Trudy and I are very close, and she came... She was born in Nazi Germany and grew up 
there, and she has stories about seeing Hitler talk when she was five and how afraid she was of him, and she just didn't understand why everybody was saying this is the most wonderful man in the world, and she thought he was like a mad dog. And she has all these stories about the war that she hasn't told anyone. She's written them down, but she's only told me some of the worst ones. And um, she has had a very sad life. I mean, she's had some happiness, but a lot of really hard things since she came over here to America in the 50s. And What do you um, get from it, Sarah? What does it bring? She's, she's not your biological mother. She's kind of an adoptive mother. I get that. So you care about one another. You learn... We un- but what do you what do you take from it most deeply? Well, I'd have to say two things. We have an emotional bond because our, although our experiences have been different in specifics, they've been similar in how we feel about them. And so mm-hmm. we have been able to connect like we haven't been with other people. And mm-hmm. um, and also, I just. I mean, that's the main thing, but I, yeah. I just think it's fascinating, her, her connection to history that she lived through. And I, I just and she can tell us things yeah. about the world from a firsthand perspective. And, and, and that and, firsthand experience of growing up in Nazi Germany when, when they were dealing with the emergence of, of a figure there who would bring uh, so much uh, calamity, ultimately— Sarah, uh, our best to Trudy and respect and happiness for that relationship you found there. Let me get one more. Bowling Green, Kentucky. Peter, you're on. Uh, um, very quickly, I know you've got a lot of callers. My favorite uh, Thanksgiving, my nun knew Peter, who I'm named after. Uh, my nun Angelina had set the table beautifully, the best china, the best linen. <laughs> and my grandfather would take a wine glass and he would spill wine on the tablecloth and say, now that the tablecloth's dirty, everyone can enjoy their meal. Everyone would clap, and we'd go on with our our dinner, and everyone had a wonderful time. The Italian grandfather who made it all easy, who made it all okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. (laughs) I love it. I knew Peter there. Thanks for that from Bowling Green, Kentucky, Peter. Uh, Dave, let's play a little more tape from the Great Thanksgiving Listen. This is Dorothy talking with her granddaughter, Megan. These stories are not always easy. They're not, and they're, they're kind of ambiguous sometimes, but about how she met her husband and about how his marriage proposal at a drive-in movie theater. So, Mo, how old were you when you met Paul, and where did you meet? We met at a dance club, and he was good-looking, but he did not know how to dance. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going out with him anymore. But he kept writing to me, and he worked in New Orleans, and Every week I'd get a letter until he came home and we started going out. And I fell in love with him. How long did y'all date before he proposed to you? Well, it must have been almost a year before. And how did he propose to you? Like, did he you didn't. know about it? Or? He just gave me an engagement <laughs> ring and asked me if I wanted to marry him. How did he do it? Like, where were y'all at? Or what were y'all in doing? the car. We was at a drive-in theater. And uh, he gave it, gave me the engagement ring, and he asked me to marry him. I started thinking. I just thought maybe it wasn't right. <laughs> and he got mad, so mad. He slammed out the car. He didn't take the ring, and he left. Left us there. So Shirley's boyfriend told me, he said, Dot. He says, you know, Edwin's a good man. He says, you'll never find anybody better. And he really loves you a lot. So I thought about it, and when he came back, I told him that I loved him. He hugged me and hugged me and kissed me, and he was so happy. I'll never forget it. But it worked out. Oh, yeah. Everything worked out fine. So, 62 years later, five kids later, 13 grandchildren later, yeah. 13 great grandchildren later. Yeah. So, it was a yes. good life. Fun. It was a good life. And I still miss him. Megan and her grandmother Dorothy in the Great Thanksgiving Listen. I mean, Dave, one thing I was struck by listening to these is that they remind everyone that life isn't simple. I mean, he asked her to marry him at the drive-in. She wasn't so sure. He got mad and stomped off and yet came back, and it worked out, as we hear there. 
It makes you wonder what the texture of that relationship was, but it's th- these stories aren't simple. They're not simplistic. No. I mean, they're just real. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's story core is like the opposite of reality TV. No one comes to get rich. No one comes to get famous. It's just an act of love and, and generosity, and that's what you hear in these um, in these pieces. And also, like I've, it's been hearing these calls um, has been like a, such a gift. The teacher Anthony, the guy who um, lost the tape of his grandmother, I've heard that that story so many times. In fact, I lost the tape of my grandparents, which is one of the reasons I started StoryCorps, mm-hmm. so nobody would make that mistake that I did. And all these interviews go to the Library of Congress. But the fact that his grandmother is still alive and he has a chance to do it again is is a twist that I've never heard before on that story. If they do but them yeah, through I mean, I you, think do we... they always have a way back to this tape, Dave? Say that again. If they do it through you, through the, through story cores, there's always a yes. way to retrieve the the, the sure. recording. If you do it on the app, um, mm-hmm. it always it goes to the Library of Congress, and there's a and and there's also a feed that's there forever. Um, and we ask people to kind of add metadata to it so it's searchable forever. Um, but yes, you can you, you will that it will be there 500 years from now, so your great 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 grandkids can listen to it someday. Joanne in Middletown, Connecticut. Joanne, thank you for calling. You're on the air. What's your story? Hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. I love your show, and I love StoryCorps. Um, About 11 years ago, my sister and I had the opportunity to interview my mom in Hartford, Connecticut at StoryCorps, Mm -hmm. Um, and we talked uh, uh, quite a bit about uh, her surviving the Hartford Circus Fire. Uh, She was 11 years old, and she was all by herself. Did you say uh, circus? um, Circus fire, Joanne? The Circus Fire in Hartford, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, like 150 people were killed. It was oh a very, a very big event, and okay. um, and she she talked a lot about uh, you know how she managed to escape and she jumped down and that there was this boy there who cut open the tent. They 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 wore um, high boots called high cuts and they often kept knives in them. And he cut open the tent and he pulled her out and um, she pulled someone else out and then she was free. Um, and when the story aired nationally, it, w- it was great prompting by the um, interview by the people working at StoryCorps to um, ask if, if t- for us to ask her what she would say to that boy if she could, you know. And she said, wow. "I'd throw my arms around him and thank him, you know. I wouldn't be 73 years old if it wasn't for him." And um, and anyhow, um, when it aired nationally, uh, some gentleman in upstate New York was listening and was listening with his wife, and he said, "I, I think I'm that boy." And he, uh, you know, it probably happened dozens of times throughout the the fire that those things happened. But yeah. he got in touch with StoryCorps, and StoryCorps got in touch with um, my mom, and um, they got to talk on the phone, and she got to thank him. And that he was you know, the boy he thought who happened. took the knife out of his boot and cut her out of the burning tent and saved her life. He did, and he did, and he was at the circus fire alone also, and he never told his parents that he was there by himself either. So it was like. Just an absolute full circle, you know, amazing experience for all of us. And plus, you know, the interview was 45 minutes. We got to find out a whole bunch of other things um, that were, it was just just great. It's an amazing story, Joanne. The the circus fire story, you got it. Your grandmother survived. The boy who maybe, with a knife from his boot, cut her out. And then after all those years back in touch, sounds like Titanic or something. (laughs) Thank you very much for sharing that, Joanne. I want to get one more in here. Uh... An interview between a grandmother and a granddaughter. It's in the story core. No names provided here. But the granddaughter here starts in the Great Thanksgiving List and starts by asking about her grandfather's death. No one ever told me this. Like, my mom won't tell me where did he die and, like, how did he die. He died in my bedroom. And the night before he died, for some reason, he couldn't sleep and I didn't sleep. And we were just talking about our lives when everybody was a baby, when mommy was a baby. And we talked a four o'clock in the morning and I, my last words to him were well you could sleep in the morning but I gotta get up so why don't we just end this conversation and go to sleep and he never woke up think that was fate? I think it was fate because we shared our whole life mm-hmm. that night and um, why would we have chosen that night to do it? Yeah. this also isn't a question but it just popped into my head why don't you want to date again? Like, is, do you think that, I don't know, like, when I watch these shows, they're saying, like, he doesn't want me to or something like that? No, I, I don't think Grandpa would have a problem with, I think if it was the reverse, Grandpa would be married now. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> Grandpa would be married now. I've had, like, about four different people in my life that I dated for a little bit. I think what happens is you get kind of independent, and I 
like to do what I like to do when I like to do it without answering to anybody who I didn't share my life with. Like anybody I'm going to meet now, I, I just don't really want to give my independence to somebody that I just meet on the internet or something. Yeah. Granddaughter, grandmother, the great Thanksgiving listen. Dave I say, the founder of StoryCorps. Dave, can I just say thank you to you for founding this thing? What I mean, I know you've had plenty of accolades, but we it does it merits saying again, thank you. This is just an amazing every Friday and here now you've got this listen going on so many ways. Thank you for getting this. Is is it is it unfolding the way you dreamed? Well you, thank you for saying that. You know, I think it's – StoryCorps is such a simple idea and it's all the calls and the tape we've heard. That's what, what gives it life, you know. And I keep – as I'm listening to these, I think of that Mother Teresa quote where she used to say, you know, we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And I hopefully with this – you know, with these interviews, they can help us remember. And it is – you know, I never I never would have dreamed that, that StoryCorps would have unfolded this way. But we've got – we're just getting started. There's a lot more work to do. Dave Isay founder, president of StoryCorps, and their great Thanksgiving listen. You can link to the link, hook to the link at our website, onpointradio.org. Dave, I say thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Tom.